Hey y'all physics and physical experiment enthusiasts, with you is Andrew Shetnikoff and our today's video will be dedicated to these wonderful items that all of you have definitely held in your hands at some point. When we make an effort to gather sunlight into a single point and ignite something by using polished glass of this kind, we refer to it as an igniting glass or a collecting lens for this purpose. And when we observe something in an enlarged perspective, we typically refer to such an object as a magnifying glass or a loop. And our video will be dedicated to both perspectives of the matter. And in order to observe how light converges into a single point, we employ this particular arrangement. In it, parallel beams of light will be formed using parallel slits, and then they will pass through a lens. And we will certainly be in the dark observing all of this, and right here we can see a total of five parallel rays. After passing through the lens, they converge to a single point. This spot is called a focal point, which in translation from Latin means a hearth. And at this moment, we will proceed to determine the manner in which this convergence takes place. If we take a triangular prism and send two symmetrical rays through it, they will refract in the glass and converge at one point on the axis. Releasing two more beams at a different distance from the axis, they'll converge at a different point. And we desire for all the rays to converge at the same point. Therefore, the rays should be deflected more strongly as they move further away from the axis. And for this, we use a prism like this. If we keep increasing the number of rays, then the prism will have to be faceted even more strongly. And in the end, you will obtain a smooth convex surface. And in combination with a flat surface on the opposite side, it will create a flat convex lens. I believe you all noticed that in the previous build, the rays did not quite converge to a single point. And this incident occurred because, firstly, the construction itself was not well calculated enough, and secondly, because the lens I was considering was quite thick and had a significant impact. And this is the moment when we naturally arrive at the point where we need to discuss the model of a thin lens, which will be explained in detail by Alexei. I have to say right from the beginning, a thin lens only exists in our theoretical constructs. This is such an impeccable object, similar to an elusive liquid or a mathematical pendulum in its precision and beauty. The drawings depict it as a thin lens assembly in the form of a two-sided arrow, as shown in the visual representations provided. The main optical axis passes perpendicular to it, and the point of their intersection is called the optical center of the lens. And such an impeccable object possesses the following set of properties that make it absolutely flawless. First thing. A bundle of parallel rays, falling on a lens along the main optical axis, converges to a point on this axis, the lens focus. The distance from the lens plane to the focus is called the focal length and is denoted by the letter F. Property number two, if you point a bundle of parallel rays along the main axis from the other side of the lens, it will also converge to a focus located at the same focal distance from the lens. Property number three, the slanted beam of light passing through the optical centers of the lens passes through the lens without refracting and maintains its direction behind it. Property number four. The inclined bundle of parallel rays is focused to a point which is located in the focal plane of the lens, where this plane is intersected by the ray that passed through the optical center. Lastly, the fifth property is that light rays have the capability to be reversed. In particular, if they come out of the focal plane, then they turn into a bundle of parallel rays behind the lens. And although, as I already said, there are no perfect thin lenses in nature, but this model in the first approximation describes real lenses well enough. To demonstrate this, let's observe how a lens focuses a slanted beam of light rays and gain a deeper understanding of its mechanism. Well, in order to get such a bundle, of course, the position of the source didn't change, but the lens itself was rotated. And here we see that the light beam passing through the optical center of the lens doesn't refract, while all the other beams converge to a point. We already know that a bundle of light rays coming out of any point in the focal plane of the lens turns into a bundle of parallel rays behind the lens. So what happens if we take a point outside the focal plane of the lens? 
How will the light beams go from there? Now we'll figure it out. The lens with its focal points is already depicted and we'll take a point source that is located further away from the lens than the focal distance. And now we are going to utilize the method of convenient rays. The ray that passes through the optical center of the lens does not undergo refraction. A beam parallel to the main optical axis will refract and pass through the back focal point of the lens. And these two rays are already intersecting at a point. And the third convenient ray passes through the front focus of the lens, and behind the lens it goes parallel to the main optical axis. And in geometry it is demonstrated that this ray will pass through the identical point as the initial two. And it is also proven that not only is it convenient, but also all other rays originating from a point source will pass through the same point, which is referred to as the image of the source. Alexei did all the necessary preparations and showed us how the simplest tasks of geometric optics are reduced to actual geometry. And now we can take the next step and derive the formula for a thin lens that relates the focal length of the lens to the two distances from the lens to the source and to the image. Let's denote the focal length as f and the distance from the lens to the source and the image as a and b respectively. And let's introduce two extra segments and denote them with the letters p and k in order to provide additional clarity. Let's take two similar triangles on the left and create a proportion where f is to a as k is to p plus k. Now let's consider two similar triangles on the right side and form the second proportion. F is to B as P is to the sum of P and K. Let us combine these two equations and we will obtain that the division of F by a plus the division of F by B is equal to 1. This outcome is generally represented as the reciprocal of A added to the reciprocal of B is equal to the reciprocal of F. And this formula is referred to as the formula of a thin lens. And now we are going to experiment with this formula. I have an optical bench set up on my table. On the optical bench, there is a source that can move along the bench like on rails. And I also position a screen here and a collecting lens between the source and the screen to ensure accurate measurements and observations. And at that point, I will proceed to move the source around and carefully observe how a sharp and clear image starts to appear on the screen in front of me. The distance from the lens to the screen was 55 centimeters and to the source, 30 centimeters. We plug in these data into the formula and get that the focal length of the lens is equal to 19.5 centimeters. And now I'm taking the lens off the optical bench and I see that it says on it that its focal length is 200 mm, but we got 195. 5 mm difference, 2% error. And as for this error, first of all, we have focusing accuracy. Secondly, distance measurement accuracy. Well, and thirdly, the lens itself is also made with some precision. And at this moment, it is time to take and model this movement of the source in the GeoGebra program, which is a powerful tool for visualizing mathematical concepts. The object shown in green is situated to the left of the lens, and its image shown in purple, is situated to the right of the lens. We constructed it by utilizing two convenient beams, which are clearly indicated in red during the presentation. When an object moves away from the lens, the image moves closer to the back focus point and becomes smaller in size. And when the object approaches the front focus, the image moves away from the lens and becomes larger. What will happen when the object ends up in the focal plane? The rays will become parallel, causing the image to extend to infinity, appearing infinitely distant from the observer's perspective. However, the most fascinating thing occurs subsequently when we bring the object even closer to the lens. The image originates from infinity, but already from the same side where the object is positioned. And it turns out to be an intersection, not of the light rays themselves, but of their extensions in the opposite direction, which are shown here in green. This type of image is referred to as imaginary, and we will discuss its physical meaning in more detail at a later point in time. And at this moment, it is time to conduct some experiments, and I am handing the floor back to Alexei, allowing him to take charge once again. 
I want to talk about why when I look through a lens, I see the image sometimes clear and sometimes blurry, sometimes enlarged and sometimes reduced, sometimes straight and sometimes upside down. And it would be absolutely fantastic if you could grab a lens and conduct some straightforward experiments together with me. And for my first attempt, I'll grab a lens, push it away at arm's length, and look into the distance at the houses across the street. And we perceive through the lens frame an inverted image of a garage with snow on the roof. And now let's put a matte screen between the camera lens and the lens, placing it in the focal plane of the lens. The picture is focused on the screen, and now we can see even more than we used to see through the lens frame. Let us concentrate our attention on this snowy location. Let us eliminate the screen. And the stain remained the same in the same place, only it became brighter. Let's break down this experience. When there was a screen behind the lens, the rays from each point of the object passing through the lens focused on the corresponding point of the screen. And so there was an inverted image of the object. And an eye or a camera with which we were shooting is behind the screen and looking at it. And the rays from the screen pass through another collecting lens, the camera lens, and focus on the photosensitive matrix. And now for the most important part. Take a look at these rays moving towards the screen and these ones that extend them and move away from the screen. If I remove the screen, the light on this diagram will continue to flow and therefore the image on the matrix will not change. And I should also mention that in the diagram the object was positioned near the lens. But in reality I am observing objects that are located at a significant distance from me. So it can be inferred that the rays from them are parallel and converge at the focal plane of the lens. And it is this image that I am currently gazing at, although you are currently unable to perceive it visually at this precise moment in time. Now we're going to do the next experiment using a magnifying glass as a magnifying lens. I placed it in front of myself, I positioned a ballpoint pen behind it, and I began pushing it away. The image of the pen is growing increasingly larger. Let's witness what I see as I replace my eye with the lens of a camera, capturing the expanding image. At this moment, the pen is pushed up close to the lens. I begin to push her away, and as I do, the image grows larger, pushing the handle further and further. Eventually, the image becomes bigger and finally blurs completely. To explain what we see, let's go back to our diagram in GeoGebra. The pen is shown in green, while its imaginary image is shown in purple. When the object is close to the lens, its image is nearly the same size as the object itself. Now let's move the object towards the lens focus, and as we do that, the virtual image keeps moving further and further away, and its size keeps getting bigger and bigger. Blurring happens when an object moves through the focal point of the lens, as the image becomes actual and ends up positioned behind the observer's head, causing it to be invisible. And now for another experiment and another way to view the object with noticeable magnification. I positioned the magnifying lens very close to my eye and carefully brought the object extremely near, ensuring it was within a short distance to enable me to see its individual small details with utmost clarity and precision. Let's replace the eye on the diagram with its model, with a camera with a lens set to infinity. Parallel rays originating from a remote object will come together at the rear wall where the retina is situated within the eye and the camera possesses a sensor. If you squint your eyes, the image will be positioned behind the back wall. However, we can make adjustments to the camera lens and the eye adjusts its lens so the image ends up on the back wall again. But this adjustment is not unlimited. If you move the object even closer, you will not be able to focus the image anymore and instead of a point on the back wall, a blurry spot will appear. And when we place a converging lens in front of our eyes, it also refracts the rays, causing them to converge on the back wall, enabling us to observe an object that is positioned very near to the eye. And speaking of the eye, its optics, accommodation, nearsightedness and farsightedness, and their correction with glasses, we have a separate video dedicated to this topic, 
and I highly recommend that you watch it. And we have already discussed extensively about the converging lens, but there is still the unexamined diverging lens, and Alexei will be providing insights on it now. Well, I must say right away that I always have diverging lenses with me at all times. These are my glasses that correct nearsightedness. But the scatter lens is right in front of me on the table. And with her, everything is significantly easier than with a collecting lens. Because regardless of the distance I look, or when observing an object up close, I consistently see the same thing, which is a straight reduced image that remains unchanged. And now we will figure out why this is happening. And in order to do that, let us start by drawing the path of the rays. And here is depicted a concave convex lens onto which a bundle of parallel rays falls. When it refracts, this beam diverges, but the diverging rays can be extended backwards, and these extensions will converge at one point, which is also called the focal point of the lens. And now we will make a transition from a real diverging lens to its model, which represents a thin diverging lens, in order to further illustrate the concept. Well, I must say that the properties of a thin scattering lens are exactly the same as those of a thin converging lens. And the diverging lens is indicated in drawings by arrows that point in the opposite direction. And at this point, it is only natural for us to observe how the position of the source relates to its image using GeoGebra software. The source is shown here again in green color, and two convenient rays are drawn from it one through the optical center of the lens and the other parallel to the main optical axis. The imaginary image, shown in purple, is located at the intersection of the first ray and the backward extension of the second. When I move the source away from the lens, the virtual image moves closer to the focus and gradually decreases in size. We have already determined how individual lenses operate. However, what is even more fascinating is how they collaborate in optical devices. We'll talk about that in other videos. And now I'm going to move on to our traditional final question. And today, he will be like that. How to determine the focal length of a converging lens? Got it. We need to focus on the screen, the image of the remote source, and measure the distance from the lens to the screen. So here is how to measure the focal length of a diverging lens that only produces virtual images. Share your thoughts regarding this matter in the comments section of this YouTube video.